Hi, my name is Benedict for High Hertz. In this video, we're looking at high pass filters. The question specifically was how to use a high pass filter when mixing. Um, it's funny, I know these questions are popular and they a lot of them come out of questions that get asked on Google, but the questions themselves are slightly broken. And as I've said before, I think it was in the EQ uh, video, if the question's broken, the answer has to be broken. I see people answering these head on and answering them literally, and you go, that is not how it's used or not how you, how you really mix. The question should always be, why use a high pass filter when mixing? What's the purpose? What am I trying to achieve? So I'm going to start by giving you a little sense of why we might want to do this. You might want to listen carefully. Um, I assume that you're always using your studio setting when watching these videos where I'm showing mixing and what have you. If you're not, well, you're probably not going to hear anything. If you're not hearing something, it probably means that you haven't tuned your brain to hear these things. Uh, to me, they're very pronounced. To you, if they're not, you've got to tune your ears. Now, some people are never going to be tuned to that. That's fair enough, in which case your answer is, I'm not really a mix engineer. I'm a guitarist or I'm a singer or I'm whatever you are, be that. Uh, but understanding what is being done when people who are good at this are doing it is still a good thing to have. So let's move forward. Here's a piece of music. Here's a little piece of music as though it's coming from a phone speaker. Why? Because we can still actually hear the issue that's happening here. I'll run this again and give you an opportunity to hear the issue. What's wrong here? Apart from the fact that you think it sounds terrible and gutless. That's because I've made it sound like an iPhone speaker. We should have two, maybe three issues that we can hear. The first thing that I would notice myself is that there's this nasty lurch. There's a nasty pump when the kick comes in. It's probably the last thing that most people are going to notice, but it's the first thing that I would notice because it's broken. Uh, the kick has no real presence. It's this little pop up top, which tells me that it's a very heavily bassy kick. Uh, with maybe a little bit of click on the front end, uh, but that the person who's mixed it has mixed it for bass, not for presence in a mix. Uh, and then at some stage I might consider, why did they write a piece of music that's just uh, an incredibly subby kick and uh, this string sound? Well, they didn't. There's actually a bass sound in there, but where's the bass? So they're the three things that I hope that you noticed. I expect you probably noticed them in a different order, but they're the three things to notice. So the question here is why use a high pass filter in mixing? Well, this is a submix. So here we go. We've got our piece running. I've got a high pass filter here. If I turn this on, Can you hear the difference? Now, I hope that you hear two differences. One is that the piece suddenly got a little quieter. And two is that most, if not all, of that annoying pumping has now dissipated. There are two advantages here. One is that the annoying pumping has dissipated. And two is that it's got a little quieter. And you're going to go, but we never want quieter, Benedict. Yeah, but too much of a bassy mix is actually using too much bottom end. So seeing we've got that level back, hooking at about minus eight or about minus seven, Now I can push this up a few dB. 
for roughly 3 dB. That or that. I can clear the the in the pad, the string, every time. This the string is nice and smooth and even. People want there to be this in their pad sounds, and that's fine. But you notice that there's no ducking happening here. No bad, stupid side chaining. Uh, so if it's ducking on the end, if it's not a deliberate decision, then there's something wrong. So we've been able to eliminate that awful, unnecessary, unwanted pumping, which is what the real term is in this case, because we weren't trying to duck anything, we just got nasty pumping, and we were able to push another 3 dB. So when we actually go into this, you should feel that that mix actually sounds more even, more solid, more confident. And that's exactly what we want out of our mix. So this is a case of having used a high pass filter and allowing ourselves to add some more level. High pass filters. Why would we use them? As we see, if we've got an overly bassy or muddy mix, we might want to use a high pass filter to actually roll off the stuff that's down below. If we can't tell that we've got an overly bassy or muddy mix, and many people cannot tell this, which means that they haven't developed their, their brain, their hearing, their understanding of what makes a mix work, uh, then a sure sign of that often is that you just can't get your mix loud enough. You see how applying the high pass filter here allowed us to put another 3 dB on and come out with the same numbers up top here, are saying peak levels, uh, whilst actually giving us a more solid, smooth, comfortable feel. And that was whilst we were in iPhone mode. So high pass filtering is used a lot to reduce over bassiness that in effect simply makes a mix muddy and wastes a lot of level. So we can see here that the difference between this and this is really 3 dB. So by doing this, I can give myself 3 more dB, as well as making the mix sound more even, more smooth, less broken with that ghastly pumping. Let's look a little bit about what a high pass filter is. We'll open up this guy here. Now you can see a high pass filter in action here. Oh, look at that. That's a little gruesome, brutal and gruesome. We're used to low pass filters that do this. High pass filter is just like a low pass filter. Let's get rid of the gain. Only it works upside down. So it lets everything above itself pass. Low pass lets everything below itself pass through untouched. Everything above gets rolled off. High pass meaning everything above this point gets discarded and this is kept. They can, when used poorly, give you a very anemic sound. In other words, sound like an iPhone. This is simply because little tiny speakers can't reproduce much below about 1K. You can have different roll-offs, as in how much they reject what's below. You can see here, much smoother. So with a 12 dB roll-off, meaning that there is 12 dB down as we move an octave. So if we put this at 100, there we go. Then at 50, we're at roughly minus 12 dB. These things are never exactly precise, and the lines that are drawn here are never necessarily what you're really hearing, but give or take, at minus one octave, you should have dropped 
12 dB. If we move to a 24 dB, then we should have dropped 24 dB, which is off the scale here, which is fair enough, that's probably about right. And at 48 dB, we have dropped 48 dB over that octave. So 100 to 50 is an octave. We have chopped an awful lot off. So we can get very aggressive. And there are times where each of these is appropriate. You can have smoother curves like 6 dB or less or whatever, but these are easier three main ones. You will see 96 dB as well, which is really, really brutal. Um, nothing wrong with it. Again, as long as you're careful, it can have purpose. So that's what they do. There is another function, however, with a high pass filter, just like a synth. You might have noticed my resonance was raised here. As I bring this in, it de muddies and de flubs that bass. But we start to lose bass as well, we lose punch. We can use the resonance to create a point. I've spoken about this before. So now what we've done is we've reduced some of the, the sub, sub, sub that you need a sub to really hear properly. And we've now raised that kick from being really low. Um, what's this saying? If we've got this off, kick is speaking um, 40, 45, I and mean, it's, it's about 42 by the time it's really on its low end. See, we've moved the energy up. Now got a lot more energy here. meaning we can turn the level up. So what we're doing is we're lifting the perception of that sound. We will still perceive it to be pretty bassy, but remember, in music's all about illusion. There are gonna be people watching this going, but it's not as bassy as it was before and it needs to be that bassy or it's not proper. Okay, go for it. If you are working only in bass music, knowing that all your listeners, every single one of them has a 36 inch sub uh, and no phase in problems in their room, Go for it. Leave it wide, wide open. Put a boost on it even. But for the rest of us who need to make a working mix, especially a working mix that might pass muster on an iPhone speaker when somebody is like, then we need to do what we can to lift the perception of our sound. So we lift that up a little bit and we can use a high pass filter to do this. This isn't the best for doing it because it's only a 12 dB roll off, but it does show you that even with a soft filter, you can really change the feel of what's happening there. So your high pass filter is quite simply about taking things and rolling them away. You can then, if it's got a resonance, create a peak around that. Uh, some, well, most synth filters um, will do that, uh, but just be careful that you're not using that as a, uh, as, as a poor man's EQ and doing more damage than good. Uh, and many fancy EQs will do that as well. I'm not so sure that this one does. Um, no, it, it, it doesn't, and that's not a problem uh, because we could simply double up. We could say, okay, and create ourselves a fairly pointy point there. And we've still got exactly the same result. Two main uses for the high pass filter. One is to roll off what we don't want or have use for, what is often actually sucking a huge amount of level, like it's pushing a lot of level into our meters, making it harder for us to raise the impact. Remember when you're mixing, you're looking for punch, snap and sizzle. And if we've got a huge amount of bass down at 30, 40 hertz, um, anything below about 60 hertz, if we've got a huge amount of bass down there, while it sounds very 
The problem is most people aren't going to be able to hear it. Therefore, like when we listen to my mix here, you can barely hear the kick and you can't hear the bass at all. It's simply gone, in which case we need to look at ways to raise that and a roll off of uh, using a high pass filter is a big part of that. So let's look at our mix and pull it apart. This is going to use the, um, the low pass, but the low pass alone isn't the solution. You will see plenty of people saying, oh, well, you just take your sand and you, um, well, effectively gut it. So you'll see this kind of stuff. And it's not the best way of going. Not the best way of going at all. We generally don't solve our problem with one thing. We commonly solve it with two or three things which are used in lesser amounts and often in balance with all the other things that are there. There was one more thing. This is a, a, a use that is really quite good if you use it carefully. If you don't, it's just, well, it kind of messes up what you're doing. With this compressor, part of the reason that we're hearing that every time is because as you see, the kick and the bass are putting a lot of energy in here and they're causing this to really take a nosedive. You can hear it really obviously now, at least you should be able to. And it doesn't matter how much we turn up our level to compensate. That, that string, which is supposed to be smooth, just goes every time. And it actually makes me feel sick like that. This is not a thing that you want to do. We can use a high pass filter here. See how this is just poleaxing what we're doing. Our poor compressor is responding to this absurd amount of level. We can reduce how much it listens to that level. So we are in essence saying, okay, I'll put a high pass filter here. Therefore you don't need to listen to it as much. Big problem? Not as much. Obviously we're overdoing the compression at the moment. Let's put it back roughly where it was. So even there, if I pull that up to uh, 100 hertz, which is, as I say, something like that, there, there, every, every image is going to look different, then the compressor isn't listening as much to those great big crazy gobs of bass up there, and therefore we reduce the amount of compression overall. And we can pull back to get a better level. Maybe this. There is still some negative impact, but it is not as brutal as it was. So many devices will have a high pass on your compressor. Some of them are preset somewhere around 40, 80, 100. Um, if that's the case, by all means, but just consider that when you're setting up your compression. Do I want this compressor to pull in the whole signal, or do I want it to de-emphasize the amount of bass? If you've got too much bass, de-emphasizing the bass is not solving your problem. It's solving the, the, the pumping issue here, but it's not solving the fact that you've got too much bass in your mix. But it is a, a very valid purpose for this. Using this high pass filter is not affecting what the what the audience hears, it's merely affecting the side chain, as in the signal that's being used to decide what compressory things we're going to do. Now we've got this mix and it is struggling, especially with reverb, because we're putting an awful lot of bass into our reverb. Let's just It's not great. That is problematic, which is one of the reasons why a lot of not very good modern mixers will actually pull out their reverb entirely. 
going, oh, well, that makes a better mix, it's clearer. Yes, you're creating another problem to solve the first one. And every solution creates a problem, but I think you're creating a far greater problem because your mix is dry and placeless. No depth, no sense of place around it. It gives you more bass, but that bass has no, no magic, no love, no room, no place, nothing attached to it. To say, oh, well, the pl place where the person's listening to will attach that space. If they're in a basketball court, yeah. Although that'll probably be problematic in a big way. Uh, basketball court's going to rattle with all that bass. But if they're using headphones, buds, or their little eye device, remember, they can't hear squat and they just get this nasty, creepy, dry sort of thing. Uh, let's look at our kick and the things that we can do. So we first we've got our kick. There's so much bottom end down there, and while that's kind of cool, it's kind of not helping things. So let's look at, firstly, what can we get rid of in terms of the decay of this? Here, how as I reduce that decay, now it gets too short, it becomes a pop. But our level is going down, so we've got more. We could actually turn that up. But about there, we've still got the sense of that bass there. But we've not got so much long flub and what have you. If we pick a point with a pointy point here and decide well okay where do I want my kick to have its power you can go high but and that's possibly worth considering while it's tempting to do this all we're doing is going right back where we began Now we've lifted this and pop up the image I often show. Headphones are the worst thing that I would ever use for doing this. But I'll show the image again where we mix here in the middle. We do not spend our time mixing sub subs and ultra highs uh, because most people can't hear them anyway. And if they do listen to on any kind of real world device, then they're not going to be able to hear your piece at all and then you'll be all like boo-hoo I made my mixes they sound absolutely awesome in my studio as soon as I put them anywhere else they die yeah because you haven't managed your bass at all you've been too busy trying to manage your bass because you haven't managed your mids which means you've over managed your bass yes we trade off some low kind of stuff but it's not getting us anywhere. Remember when we had that in iPhone mode, we uh, couldn't hear squat. So if we put that up at 1K, give or take. We haven't changed things a lot, but we have freed a lot of energy. So there's now a lot less energy being wasted. We've got our punch now up here rather than down here. We can even use a more aggressive roll off if we want rather than the, the softer roll off of this one. But that one's on the masters so I'm going to leave it at. Let the human brain here and add that bassiness in. So that's brought us back a few dB here. There's a lot of real rumble under there, and while it's sort of impressive, it's using a lot of power. So we've now got better 
punch and better snap out of that. We wouldn't expect sizzle on this if you're thinking, oh, it's a little bit too bright. You can do this. If you don't want that feeling that, oh, it's got this little pop and that makes it bright and seem small and thin and what have you, fine by all means. Bear in mind that that's what's gonna pull it through a busy mix. But you can roll some of that off. That gives us a clearer sense. Now we've got this fella, Subchub. The problem with Subchub is that Subchub is inaudible. Uh, I can hear it just on my um, on, on my monitor speakers. Um, it's okay. I wouldn't mix it, but uh, on these I can hear there's something down there, but I can't. I couldn't tell you what whether it was in tune, out of tune, whether it had a tune or not. It's just not there. So in other words, it's pointless. It all is doing is using an awful lot of energy <laughs> and achieving nothing for anybody. So low pass would say, yeah, we're not getting anything out of that at all. So we're not going to start with a low pass. We're actually going to start by fixing the sound. And that is it needs to actually have the ability to speak higher in the audible range. OK, now I can hear it. So I've used FM in this case, simply to take our hard, perfect sine wave and give it some overtones. And that sounds bassy and I can hear it. And I can actually hear it in the mix. I don't expect to hear it in um, iPhone mode. Shall I just leave this set in? iPhone mode so it's easier. And we'll give ourselves that. Maybe. 9 dB. Can I hear the bass? No. Well, I might be vaguely aware there's something there. Sorry, wrong button. Yeah, I'm vaguely aware there's something there, and that's just in these headphones, even though we've got 1K rolling everything off. So we still actually got to win. Now we can improve our win. not achieving anything we can improve our win by rolling that off and then by doing this I've pretty well abandoned the fundamental of this because it's inaudible down at 30 Hertz or whatever it is we've now moved our, our what appears to be our fundamental here to let's say 70 65 70 and this becomes its first overtone and that's at a hundred. Ah, that's that's far more audible. So if we put ourselves into iPhone mode, I can actually start to hear this. It's not great, but I'm I can actually hear that there's a sound there. So I've got better punch. I'm actually starting to define the rhythm that this bass line has. Sometimes it's literally the same as the, um, uh, as the kick drum, and then sometimes it moves around. But we couldn't tell that before. So now we've got something that, that kind of looks like what we wanted. Another common thing is to add overdrive. And that's just doing what I was doing with before. It is making it louder.
but it is increasing these overtones here. So by using those, we can actually While that sounds bass here, we're struggling to get the, the rhythm. The other thing we could have considered, but you notice it's not giving us the same results. This does still sound more down low. Because we've put overtones in, the human brain hears those overtones and tracks them backwards, looking for the fundamental. The fundamental is largely rolled off. It's disappeared effectively now compared to where we were. Just down here, but we couldn't hear the damn thing. You see the distortion there just added an overtone. So that made it entirely useless. Um, but now we brought it into the mix. And we can hear its rhythmic activity. That is great. I would suggest that keeping the sound in the mix all the time is unwise. If it fades out a little bit, it allows for a better sense of punch. Because if it's holding and then re-triggering, it's really sort of struggling to achieve much of anything. Which means that we can also look at an envelope here. We've set a default amount for our waveform to give us these overtones. We can do this. Hear how that suddenly becomes far more audible? Meaning we can reduce the, the, the long-term waveform by focusing on giving it more punch so the waveform gets more interesting and then fades away. Now in headphones, I can hear this really clearly. It's like meaty, it's powerful, uh, it's very simple, but it is achieving the things that the composer, me, hoped to get from here. So while we've achieved most of this without the high pass filter, the high pass filter actually turns out to be an important part of it because without that, it's kind of flubby. We're losing the impact of the rhythm. Now that bass is very boom, 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 rather than be uh, and this is why we're using the high pass, because we don't actually get good value out of that fundamental, those really low lows anymore. We've lifted this up into the more workable spectrum. Let's put ourselves in iPhone mode again. Now, to be fair, that really low bass sounds a little bit more like a second kick. But the rhythm is actually... Now, well, it's there. It's not super. It's never going to be super. Never, ever, ever. But the thing is, we've now got that sense of rhythm in there. Otherwise, it just doesn't exist at all. This is where, as I said before, you don't use one tool. You use several different tools. And it's also about the balance. So this on its own... We can hear it's there, but it's not achieving a lot on its own. But once we put the kick in and we get the balance right, then we've got the rhythmic results that we want. So a high pass is integral to doing that. Even though we've achieved more with the um, adding harmonics, uh, if we turn off that high pass, 
then we lose a fair amount of the work that we've done with adding the harmonics. It's about creating clarity. Remember, mixing is never about making what's there there. Mixing is about creating the illusion, having the listener hear and feel what you want them to feel. If you need them to feel uh, 30 hertz, that's fine. But as I say, you need to know that they have a 36 inch sub, in which case you've got to specify on the front of your record must have 36 inch sub or don't bother. Or like, um, I think it was Meteor, a movie uh, that came out, insisted that the, um, that the cinemas that were going to show it uh, bought the, uh, the JBL earthquake system, which was, I think, put together for, maybe it was Earthquake or Meteor, I think it was Meteor, which was, a, which was one of those disaster movies, um, Towering Inferno, Meteor, what have you, and they wanted people to feel this rumble. And they specified that to get this movie, which was hot property until people watched it and went, oh, that really wasn't very good. But that's part of why cinemas suddenly became a lot basier because of Meteor and the subs being put in to allow you to show said movie for about a week before nobody showed up to watch it after they realised it wasn't very good. But if you don't know that your people have subs, assume they don't, assume that they're going to be listening to something a little closer to this. I mean, that's brutal and nasty, but nonetheless, it is an issue. Now we've got our string. Many of you are going to say, well, what's this got to do with anything? There's no, uh, there's no bottom end in here, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Bearing in mind what this string is designed to do, and I hope you can understand that, which is that it's supposed to be light and airy and floaty and smooth and a little bit silky, Doesn't it get nicer once that high pass filter goes in? It's not the only way of doing it. We could use this as well. Or we could do a little of both. We could say, I want to start rolling off higher. Which is different from doing this which just kind of gets a little bit harsh and hard. It's not getting us where we want it to go. Yes, it's brighter, but it's not really nicer. So by understanding, well, what do we want to get rid of here? We want to expose these frequencies up here so they become clearer. This is removing some of it, like in de-emphasizing the lows, therefore there's masking for these. And then a half pass filter is just getting rid of these fundamentals. And guess what? One of the basic ways to make a string, if you read one of the classic how to make a string synth sound, it is you get your sawtooth, because it's got the most overtones and sounds the most string-like, and then you get a high pass filter up so that it's just starting to roll off the fundamental. That's how you make a string. So that's what we're doing here. We're making this string feel more string-like, as in more like a whole lot of Mozartian scrapers all going at once so that we feel all kind of, and that's what we've done. In the mix, hear how this is interfering with the low end? because we've picked our bass up and we've actually got our bass sort of happening up here now. There's still some overlap. We haven't gone silly like this, which leaves a scrapey hole in the middle of our mix. There's still some connection, but we've got this sense of our big, powerful bass thing happening between our kick and our bass, and our floaty strings happening on top. But they still feel connected. And that is mostly from our high pass. The fact that we've used the EQ as well, yes, that is good. 
it's just allowed us to unmask or reduce the amount of masking, therefore these seem brighter, lighter, clearer, without sounding hard, which they'll do when we EQ them. Like this. Or we can even do a little bit of this, and they sound nice. But if you don't want them to be too clean or clear, you can do a little bit of both. Looking at our compressor, a lot less work's happening now. And it is still pumping, but we could almost suggest that maybe that's not a terrible kind of a pumping. It's sounding a little bit more like the ducking kind of thing because we can hear our bass. We've got our rhythmic elements happening correctly. In other words, the pumping that's happening here is now part of that rhythm. Is it a good thing? Um, I think it's a little excessive myself. Well, let's say we pull this to, let's say 80, and then see what our shape should be. That's going a lot tighter. Now that's the kind of thing that I would do because it's now helped make that bass sound more powerful, majestic and thrummy. The reason being is that we're using the pumping but very slightly, not enough to be a like that ghastly side chain ducky kind of thing, but to use the way that we perceive level, volume, loudness, overwhelmingness, to push that string down just a tiny bit, the mix goes down just a tiny bit at that point. We don't necessarily hear that everything's being ducked or pumped, but we're using a mild amount of that that it puts the emphasis on that kick drum and bass combo, making them seem even larger. So if we A, B, no compression, straight. We don't have as much groove. It's not as commanding. See how it's more commanding, but without that oof kind of thing. We've got a strong sense of what our rhythm is. And the strings are just, well, giving us some reason to not want to turn this off because it's pointless. There's still something else that we could do and probably should do. Thank you, Tal, for improving this reverb. So it was a good way to show an example. Remember if we've got, that's just like a lot of muck. We want to have some bass still. Let's roll off a little on the top too whilst we're at it. Clear and flat, no space. Meaning that we could choose to possibly increase our reverb. Or maybe just go, you know, let's go 45.50. So the reverb is still giving us stuff in the kick and bass, but it's not as flubby or muddy, as uncontrolled as it was before. Let's get up our... So that's just our... We want that kick and what have you to be involved. I'm going to say somewhere around 50 is probably nice. It 
So it clarifies and allows that kick to actually come forward even better. So let's pop ourselves back into iPhone mode again. It's not a good mix because it's not a good composition because it's not taking an iPhone or that kind of listening into account, but it is coherent. We can't hear the bass as such, but at the same time, there's just a slight sense of there being something there. Oops. Sorry, got a bit loud. Forgot about the boost there, but yeah, here at 60 hertz with roll off. We can hear all of this just fine. Yeah, we're losing a little bit of extension, but you know, no one's going to notice the difference. They're just going to be listening to the rhythm that we've got. That's the whole thing. So we have gone from this, which is a bit of a mess, and all over the place. I think actually this didn't have that compression in it. So this. See that's we've given ourselves probably the ability to maybe add a dB, a dB and a half. This, which is lots of wasted level and unpunchy, can't hear the bass at all. So this is where we've got the bass in the mix, the rhythm's happening, and it's punchy. And even better, assuming that was a good thing, we've been able to push another dB into our output. Assuming that's a good thing in the situation, I think it probably is. So that actually helps bring some of that level and what have you in there. There's a lot to it, as I said. It's never as simple as just apply one thing and you're golden. Do not go hacking the toes off everything, like the fundamentals off everything, going that's going to fix it. We've got to pair in my what's in our mix. It was wise to hack a fair amount off this string because A, it helped clarify the string and make it sound prettier, and B, it stopped it from well, fighting with the upper parts of that bass. We've got enough that they still work together. They've still got connection to each other. Remember, if we've got no connection whatsoever, like there's a reason we wouldn't be using um, this bass and kick and a piccolo, um, um, because there's just, just nothing to tie the two together. We need something that ties the two together. In this case, it's this string or pad. We might then say, hey, Mr. Piccolono, can you come over here and toot us your tiny flute? Because it's going to make sense. We've got that string, which has got uppers, and the high, which is coming out of our piccolo. That allows us to tie them together. So everything is always going to be based on whatever the ever else is in the mix and happening at that time. Uh, and we have used our high pass filters to clarify all of our sounds so that we can focus them where we need to be, which is more in the middle. All right, it is one of those things that's gonna take time and understanding. Remember, you have to train these, not your headphones. Your headphones are useless. You should throw them away, drive them, them with your car, uh, but train your ears because you're really training your brain, not your eyes, your brain. What's inside here is what you're actually training. Uh, so it takes some time to do this. Yes, in the short term, if you are questioning your mix and it's low end and its ability to translate, there is nothing wrong with getting aggressive with a, um, a high pass filter. See, I can get, I can take quite a lot of that and not lose anything. So we've moved from speaking down here to speaking up here. So we've moved at least an octave. 
which is a good thing. But in your learning, if you're going, yeah, I'm struggling with my mix, and especially if you're struggling with your mix with it seeming uh, like you can never get it loud enough, then try this kind of stuff. And then once you start to be able to hear without that excessive amount of bass, which most people put in because they get their they get their bass like this, and then they go, oh, okay, I know what I need to do, and they do the bass right up. Uh, I'm going, isn't it amazing? It's like, no, you, you got no, you got nowhere to go. So you can bring in your filters and go, okay, now I've got real clarity and then start working out how to get your things to work where they should. If there are any questions, hit subscribe, please. File a question on down below. Please don't ask me to mix your thing for free. I've had a couple of them this morning. Not cool, dude. Not cool at all. Um, I am more than happy to help, but... <laughs> You've got to give value for value somewhere. If somebody gives you value and you don't return value, that's commonly the same as me going into my neighbor's house, lifting 50 bucks out of his wallet. There is a term for that. Uh, but I am open to answering public questions, which means that if you are asking about your mix, I need to see and hear your mix so everyone else can see and hear your mix. And then we can have a real discussion about that down below uh, and yeah otherwise my name again is benedict these are for higher hertz there is higherhertz.com you can pop over there. there's a different channel of information and if this has piqued your interest there are a ton of videos and most of my videos even my reviews contain some sort of training stuff most important thing is get out there practice this and have a great day